Welcome, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I am Ayan Kishore from Benetech. This is the third discussion in our three part series of programs around inclusive education. Uh, from everyone around, joining from around the world, we know there's a lot of you from everywhere. Uh, thank you for joining us today. The previous two panels covered the domestic ecosystem and how technology and community can come together to enable inclusive access to personalized learning. Today, we're going to take this conversation globally, uh, which is very timely because uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day is next week on May 19th. And the purpose of Global Accessibility Awareness Day is to get everyone talking, thinking, and learning about digital access and inclusion. So let's do that one week early. We're going to highlight and discuss ways that communities globally can benefit from accessible technology, what the challenges are, and how we may work on removing obstacles to equitable education for students with disabilities. I'm really excited because we have a panel of global experts representing education, technology, and impact work around the world. Uh, so I'll quickly introduce them. Uh, Radhika Shah is an impact tech investor with Illumin Capital. Tony Bloom is the founder and executive director of M Education Alliance. Uh, Shelly Hartman Sanyak is a senior program manager uh, with World Vision focused on all children reading. And Dr. Homyar Mubedji is a book share program manager for Asia and Africa. We're really excited to have such a group of luminaries here today, but also this is your conversation. So uh, I'm already seeing people chatting. Please uh, feel free to throughout the discussion, uh, chime in with questions and thoughts around your, you know, your experiences, your best practices, challenges and gaps uh, with respect to the, the conversation and your questions. Uh, we have the Q&A box enabled, which is part of the Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to type in questions at any point. Uh, we'll try really hard to get to your questions, but if we don't get to it during the event, we'll follow up with you after. Uh, there's also a really active LinkedIn chat, so we will uh, continue to uh, converse over there as well. A little more on housekeeping. This uh, webinar is being recorded. Only the panelists visible on the screen will be recorded. Uh, we will post a recording and additional information later in the week on the LinkedIn event page. Uh, there is also live captioning today that's provided by ACS Captions. To turn captions on, use the CC or closed caption option in the Zoom controls menu at the bottom right of your screen. Uh, you can also access an AT friendly stream text transcript in your browser at the link provided in the chat. I find that very useful. Um, all right, with that, let's all get started. So I'll frame the conversation a little bit and then uh, uh, pass it on to the uh, uh, the amazing panelists we have here. So, you know, to start off, I think, you know, it's difficult to have a conversation about uh, this topic without uh, um, understanding that the pandemic is what we've been through in the last couple of years. We've known the pandemic has laid bare inequities and opportunities in education technology, and we've seen our work evolve globally. Um, and I think with that, I'd like us to kick it off by inviting Dr. Homiyar Mubaji to share a case study from Benetech's work in India, where we have seen our work adapt from leveraging Bookshare to other technologies and broader trainings to better prepare students for the workforce. Uh, Homiyar is a highly experienced professional in everything related to accessibility, and I, I will I will not uh, 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 shame in here, but you know I'm really excited uh, for you all to hear from uh, uh, Homiyar. Apart from leading uh, Benetech's Bookshare initiative in Asia and Africa, he is himself uh, visually challenged and is a strong advocate for uh, people with visual impairment and that they should be given a chance to live a life with dign dignity by providing them opportunities for equal and accessible learning and skilling. This is Homia's word, so I'm taking it from him and sharing it with you. But Homia, please go ahead. Thanks, Anne. And welcome, everybody. Welcome from a very hot evening in India. That's where I am based. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of of a journey which happened throughout this pandemic. And this journey is all about people with visual impairment. That's my forte, that's my story. So let me give you an idea about what happened before pandemic, the pre-pandemic days, especially when it comes to educating the blind and the visually impaired in India and most developing countries, as we understand. Generally, education was synonymous for the blind with the word Braille. Braille means blind, blind means Braille. Now, that system had been going on for the last hundreds, uh, couple of hundred of years. But then, come in pandemic, everything changed, we all know. It, 
caused major disruptions. And the biggest disruption when it came to educating the blind was how do we educate the blind with hard braille when they are not in front of you, when they are remote in their homes, how can we do this? And that's when people started realizing the importance of digital literacy or digital reading and digital writing. So as the India team, we are a very flexible team as uh, people know us in India. We started innovating. And that is where we started bringing in a lot of digital tools and creating content, creating tutorials, creating pathways for people to learn how to use these tools, because these were completely new to people in India, especially the visually impaired, and more so the teachers, because the teachers were completely unaware of using digital tools. So our Bookshare team started creating awareness programs, use Zoom as a platform very efficiently. We used YouTube as our repository for all the programs that we did, and it's all there under the banner of Bookshare India. We did this for an entire year, focusing on educating, tutoring people how to use technology. And then slowly COVID receded. That gave us a chance to progress a little further and move back into a role where we could move in and support the schools progress in this direction. When we went back into the schools physically, our first observation was people did realize that digital literacy is the roadmap. Digital literacy is the way forward for educating the blind, but there was no understanding of how. And that is where we came up with a new project intended for India specifically, where we targeted like-minded schools for the blind, where we initiated this entire process of teaching the teachers how to use digital tools initially, training them in the use of assistive technology, helping the school acquire assistive technology through other partners with uh, whom we are connected. And then we can, uh, concentrated on the students who are the most receptive of the lot, because with students, we all know that teaching them assistive technology is the most easiest. They were so receptive. They, accepted it very gleefully. And why did we do this? When we look at the job market, especially for the visually impaired, when we look at the employability prospects of the visually impaired, we all understand for those who have gone through a formal education, the only way forward is to use technology in their day-to-day -day job roles. And these job roles can be varied. To accomplish this, you have to be able to read and write independently in the script that the mainstream society understands. Now, for all these years and centuries, what happened was in India and on most developing countries, people with blindness were only able to read using Braille and write using scribes. So both these skills were not preparing them for inclusion into the global market. So hence we started this new initiative, Digital Literacy, where we focused on reading and writing digitally using tools which were affordable, accessible, and available. These are the three key words that we use. And what is this piece of technology which is the most affordable, accessible, and readily available? It is your Android device, the Android phone or the Android tablet, because it's cheap, readily available, and today with Android 11, it is extremely accessible. The biggest challenge when we come to use Android is touch typing because persons with blindness would find it very difficult to touch type on it. It's a very tedious process. So to make that part easy, we used an external keyboard connected to the Android phone using an OTG. That made your Android phone into a mini laptop. So this new introduction of the Android device into the classroom completely transformed the way students read and write today, especially in the schools that we support. Students get their content from Bookshare, the world's largest library. 
all their textbooks, resource material, re extra reading material, everything is there on Bookshare. So that directly lands into your Android phone. We train the students to read this material using applications which are completely accessible. And then the most important part is start writing using the external keyboard. It could be in English or it could be in their vernacular language. Fortunately, technology today is so accessible that you can write in any vernacular language which is supported through a TTS, the text-to-speech engine. So if you have the text-to-speech engine, the voice of the language, you can read and you can write in that particular language. Once we have achieved this, this opens up new door pathways. Students in India are now able to take up science subjects, maths, which was mostly unheard of, blind students taking up maths. They were encouraged to leave maths pre-COVID. They were said, no, maths is not accessible. You don't do it because with Braille, it's very tedious. How are you going to do maths? People were told not to take up science. All this has started changing. Students have started taking up maths and they're brilliant at maths because they love the subject. We see many students being extremely inquisitive about science. And when we introduce them to tactile models and the power of digital reading, it has completely transformed the way students have started reading and writing. So this is the experience that I wanted to share with you. I'm open to questions as we go along this journey. Back to Anne. Thank you, Homier. Thank you for the summary and for all the work that you do. I, I mean, you know, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing in India and how we're growing that and exciting for the potential of orgs like us to, you know, move beyond our tools to, uh, you know, given the moment, support people in broader ways based on our expertise. So, um, you know, really excited about that. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, switch from now uh, to our other panelists and uh, uh, hear from them, and then we will open it up for questions. Uh, so, you know, Bahomir spoke a little bit about Bookshare, which is uh, Benetech's flagship service that uh, provides access to the largest content, uh, largest library of uh, digital accessible content around the world. And uh, I'd like to move from there to, you know, what the rest of the larger ed tech and international education ecosystem is doing. And I think uh, uh, to get us started there, if, uh, I'd like to turn to Tony Bloom, who is uh, actually zooming in from the eLearning Africa conference in Kigali. Uh, Tony runs the Mobile for Education Alliance, or the Education Alliance, which is the world's largest convening platform for development and donor agencies focused on ed tech. So he knows quite a bit about the ecosystem. So Tony, I'm, I'm, uh, as I turn to you, you know, given the long history of uh, you, you know, coalescing the ed tech ecosystem, um, I'd love to hear from you what some of the ecosystems and the alliances promising activities are that particularly are focused on, you know, digital literacy and uh, helping learners with disabilities. Thanks, Ian. And I want to share the love back, Ian, with the great work that you've done over the years. But Benetech being a leader in terms of its uh, role and initiatives, and couldn't be more thrilled that we've had a long relationship with the Benetech over so many years. And I was going to give three little vignettes about role modeling that I wanted to use as an example in response to this question, just to plant the seeds of some initiatives or products that I think would be valuable. One of which is I used to be USAID's senior education technology specialist. And one of the publications that I really enjoyed that USAID produced was called Role Modeling, a guide for strengthening gender equality and exclusiveness in teaching and learning materials. What I really liked about that at, very, at the very beginning stages of creating new content, building in positive role models of women, uh, individuals with disabilities, other marginalized populations, and whether it's gonna be an analog or digital product, literally at the very beginning, thinking about in that content creation process, how you could build in such uh, role models. I know Shelly's gonna talk about some of the great work that All Children Reading has done in this uh, area. One of the organizations that doing good work in this space is, um, is basically eKitabu, and they have an accessible EPUB toolkit. So eKitabu is a for-profit social enterprise working in a number of countries, including my just having lunch with the team in Rwanda yesterday. And their accessible EPUB toolkit helps authors create accessible EPUB with image descriptions, accessible navigation, dyslexic fonts, and optional sign language videos. So just wanted to highlight that as one sort of product in the content creation process. The other in terms of role modeling is a group called Enable, I-N-A-B-L-E, 
and they're basically based in Kenya. And they promote coding and digital literacy skills for those who are blind or low vision. And when Enable first started, many of their instructors were sighted instructors. But now that they've been operating for a few years, many of their instructors are now low vision or blind themselves, uh, teaching digital coding skills to low vision or blind students, which is a great model of role modeling, right? I mean, uh, to be, just to pick up on Homiara's point in terms of who knows where that path will go in terms of professional development. So I just wanted to give a shout out. They're also hosting a conference uh, May 25th and 26th called Inclusive africa.org and for those that are interested i'll drop it in the chat so just to let you know about an upcoming conference and my last vignette about role modeling that involves us all is i ran across this project when i was at the world expo in dubai uh, a few months ago they're called be my eyes and what it is is it was developed by a danish furniture craftsman who's visually impaired and it's basically a free app available in 180 languages that through a live video call a blind or low vision person can request the assistance of a sighted volunteer who receives the call. That's pretty cool. So as a sighted volunteer, you install the Be My Eyes app, and then the blind or low vision user basically asks for help, checking expiry dates, distinguishing colors, reading instructions, or navigating new surroundings. So it's very cool how we could all get involved, to basically support this. It's one of the largest basically micro volunteering platforms with 6 million downloads. Uh, and then just to round it out, just wanted to say that we currently are running a math prize, a global math prize. So Homer, I love that you mentioned in terms of interest in science and math. We would be really excited to get organizations that are promoting uh, math, uh, the joy of math, nonprofit organizations to compete for this prize that we could basically highlight, highlight their great work and the competition runs until the beginning of July. So I, I'll stop there. I wanted to give a little bit of vignettes and then welcome any questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Tony, and thanks for uh, painting those. I know people are already asking for more information about those organizations. I think a few of them that you mentioned, actually, we work very closely with, such as Ikatabu and Enable and also the Inclusive Africa Conference. Ex excited that, uh, uh, you know, you, you flag these over here. Uh, Tony, thanks. I'm actually going to next uh, uh, move over to Radhika. Uh, Radhika is based in Silicon Valley and brings a different perspective. She's an advisor and investor uh, focused on impact and technology and very passionate about human rights and gender equity. Uh, so, you know, Radhika, and, and based in, in Silicon Valley and Radhika's efforts uh, uh, towards uh, equity, she's particularly, you know, looks at things at scale and how we can do things at scale. So Radhika, I'd love to turn to you uh, based on all your experiences and you know, hear what you are seeing as the challenges today at best practices or promising solutions that can ensure students around the world, especially those that are marginalized, such as girls that I know you're passionate about, students with disabilities, racial minorities, and others have access to equitable education. Thanks, Ayan. Deeply inspired by Benetech's work. Um, as co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, I am deeply involved in the world of uh, digital innovation. We live in a time of rapid change, a time of grave crisis, a time of grave opportunity. This pandemic has forced us to race into the digital age, and yet tech is creating new divides, such as the gender digital divide. Girls, rural and indigenous refugees, differently able children are getting left behind. According to UNICEF, at least a third of the world's school children could not access remote learning when COVID-19 shuttered schools. As an advisor to the Stanford Global Gender Equality Center and the SDG Philanthropy Platform, I build bridges to bring the power of digital innovation to help society using the SDG framework as a North Star. There are major challenges from this race to remote learning. Often digital education solutions are designed by men from the global North who assume high-speed internet access and smartphones. The digital gender divide is often leaving out girls in the global south, whether it be access to digital devices and the internet, social norms, or digital literacy training. Digital education innovations often don't have cultural context, making them at times uninteresting and irrelevant to the most disadvantaged, including rural girls, minorities, refugees, and differently able. Having grown up in the backdrop of the Gandhi ashram, to me, the SDGs and spirit of leaving no one behind offer a global normative framework to collaborate on sustainable solutions to advance human dignity. Participation and inclusion of all children in education sectors, digital transition is a must if we are to achieve the SDGs. SDG 4, equitable education for all, 
of, to achieve that, we need to reimagine education, shift mindsets, recognize physical and emotional well-being as prerequisites. I'll share a couple of examples. Internet Sati is tackling digital gender social norms in rural India by placing rural girls, the Satis, at the center of the village's digital transformation. These digital change agents are trained on how to use the internet and they teach their husbands how to get info on crops, their mother-in-law's info on health, thus shattering previous gender norms. A story from Bangladesh shows the criticality of cultural and historic continuity and context and emotional well-being. Brack Play Labs focus on young children in communities with limited connectivity. They found that Bangladeshi children were engaging in the play-based learning. However, Rohingya refugee children in the group would not engage at all. Upon analysis, they realized that Rohingya children were too traumatized. And until they got emotional support, they could not play or learn, nor could they relate to the material as they came from a very different culture and history. After the material was customized for the Myanmar historic context and the children provided counseling, the emotionally engaged played and learned just as well. RAP now provides telelearning and telecounseling hotlines using cell phones in Cox's Bazaar as well in our countries in Africa. The final example is ZMQ Global, which is deployed in India, Afghanistan, and Uganda. They combine relevant health and safety information with education, brought to girls on their mobile phones via fun interactive games. Girls are, who are not literate can also play and learn as the game uses icons and symbols. A child who's healthy and safe is much more likely to learn. Thank you, Ayan, for inviting me. Radhika, thank you so much for sharing some of these examples. And I, you know, I think a lot of what you pointed out is, you know, I think is is something we all are very familiar with. And it's it's great to see that such initiatives. In fact, I was just reading uh, an article yesterday at the BBC that was published around similar initiatives in India and why. You know, the, despite all all efforts, only you know forty percent of children have had any form of learning through the last couple of years because of um, you know lack of uh, lack of access, particularly digital access to the marginalized. So there's a lot lot of work to be done here, and glad to hear there there are initiatives at play. Um, next, I'd like to turn to uh, to Shelley, who I've had the amazing opportunity to work with um, uh, over the years. And uh, as Tony mentioned, she's a, a leader in actually helping make uh, system change happen and coalescing uh, investments in, in education technology, particularly for uh, children with disabilities. Um, so as, as uh, you know, Shelley has over the last decade uh, uh, you know, overseen several grants uh, through the All Children uh, Reading Grant Challenge uh, and has made pioneering grants in technology for literacy for children uh, with disabilities in developing countries. So Shelly, my question for you is, based on what you have seen happen in the last decade with these technologies, are we, you know, what are you seeing transpire? What Are we bringing them to those who need them? Are they having the impact that was promised? And what more do we need to do? Well, thanks, Ian. That's that's a big question. <laughs> um, but here at All Children Reading at Grand Challenge for Development, we're seeing really amazing things transpire. Uh, through this partnership between USAID, World Vision, and the Australian government, uh, EdTech Innovation and Research support the more than 584 million children globally who do not have basic reading skills. We've made, uh, as a partnership, awards to 90 diverse innovators since 2011 and awarded more than 25 million US dollars um, with over 35% of those going to support children with disabilities. Um, and some of the amazing things we've seen is that we've seen bedtime stories come alive for parents and children, uh, for parents who have children who are blind or deaf or hard of hearing uh, because they have access to accessible digital children's storybooks with audio and sign language. Uh, one of our favorites is I Love My Mom, and I'll put a link to that in the chat. Um, we've seen millions of children isolated from school during the COVID-19 pandemic continue learning through ed tech solutions, as many of you know. Uh, through solutions like Bookshare, like Feed the Monster, Enter in the Letters, Bloom Reader, uh, Digital Storytime, which was 
uh, a daily 30 minute broadcast in Kenya for children and families uh, with Kenyan sign language content. And those are just to name a few. Uh, we can share the links in the blog after this and you're welcome to go to the allchildrenreading.org website to uh, check out some other solutions. Uh, we've also seen peer led cohorts work together to transform global business models to drive down the cost to sustainably produce open license, accessible digital books featuring children with disabilities with sign language videos, with audio and braille, and really producing the highest quality books in the smallest file sizes so that they can be used in resource, low resource contexts like Somalia, like Samoa and Papua New Guinea, just, just to name a few. Um, we've also seen thousands of children with disabilities in the Philippines, in India, in Lesotho, in Nepal, um, one of which we partnered with, uh, with Bookshare India on. Um, so basically, uh, we've seen children with disabilities show up and show off their reading abilities uh, when they were allowed accommodations during assessments that enabled them to access the content and demonstrate their true aptitudes and achievement levels. So are they having the impact that they promised? Um, just to give one example, ACR's um, EdTech Summative Report highlights uh, some of the experiences and research from our round two awardees. Most importantly, um, it showed that EdTech can offer beneficial individualized reading experiences and learning experiences to students. Uh, so one example of that research is that children who use braille reading materials in the Reading Beyond Sight project in the Philippines had significantly higher gains on all five of the um, early grade reading assessment subtasks in both Filipino and English than their comparison group peers. So just a little snippet of, of evidence, uh, but hopefully um, intriguing uh, for the future and for some of the current work that we're doing on adapting uh, inclusive assessments for children with disabilities. Um, so I think your last question was what can be done to grow the impact? Uh, so the, re the World Bank recently uh, reported that learning learners with disability are largely excluded from assessments in, in low income contexts. Uh, so if I could just share one thing that could grow impact, it would really be um, to operationalize commitments to Sustainable Development Goal 4, to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and really have each and every one of us can commit to using appropriate assessment tools uh, that ensure full participation and success of children with disabilities. So that's governments, that's donors, that's NGOs, that's the private sector. We really all have a part in, um, in that commitment. And uh, please feel free to reach out to us at allchildrenreading.org if you're interested in, in learning more about that. So thanks, Ian. Thank you, Shelley. Thanks for thanks for sharing. And I and, and I and I know you're you're keeping it high level, but I know we've spoken about many challenges that we've faced, and I think hopefully we'll try to get some more time to discuss that. Uh, uh, but I wanted to actually now uh, open up uh, uh, the conversation to attendees. So thank you, all panelists. I think uh, there are some great questions coming in. Uh, uh, everybody on on the webinar, please feel free to uh, put in questions in the Q and A box, uh, and I'll actually kick us off and actually. Um, I start with you, Shelley, because uh, the last question that came in just is for you. So uh, uh, Robin uh, has uh, sent a message saying that, have you used any of the processes you describe with adults, especially in the workforce? Um, so in, in terms of inclusive assessments, we've, uh, all children reading, reading is focused on early grade uh, readers. So we haven't used any of them with adults, but that, that doesn't mean that they, they can't be. Um, and we're working on um, an inclusive assessment technical brief with the Girls Education Challenge that bridges into some of those older groups. Uh, so if you sign up for our website, you can hear a little bit more about that. Thanks, Shelley. <laughs> And I know at uh, at Benetech and Bookshare, we you know we're working increasingly with uh, uh, with you know young uh, students and 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 adults. Um, 
which actually will make me turn to Homier. Homier, we got a question from uh, your uh, presentation. Uh, Surinder Sharma is interested in hearing what the biggest challenge was you faced in the initiative that you described and how did you overcome it, especially you know, training teachers and getting their buy-in uh, with using accessible technology and other digital tools? Well, it's a great question, Surinder. As I said, working with students was just a, a cakewalk for us. It was the teachers who were the difficult lot and mainly those teachers who have been teaching for years on end in these exclusive schools, because for them, it was a relearning. For them, it was a change of mindset. For them, it was accepting new tools for educating the blind. So they were all so much stuck in that process of educating the blind in a particular way. For them to accept that change that now on, they should learn assistive technology first, and they should use technology to teach the children on, uh, in the day-to-day -day classrooms. Teachers will have to assess their children when they send in their homework via email, all these were major changes for them to accept. So that took us quite a long time and is still taking a long time. In fact, that process is still undergoing where we are still struggling with some teachers to find their confidence in using technology. The other challenge that we saw in the mainstream schools, the inclusive schools, the teachers were cited accepted technology immediately because in the mainstream school where in a class of 40, 50 students, there were one or two blind students. For them, the mainstream teacher found technology so revealing because that broke down the barrier between the teacher and the student. Now the teacher is able to know what the child is reading on his Android device. The child is typing and the teacher is able to read what the child has typed. So it has completely broken down the barrier which was there for the mainstream teacher in an inclusive environment. So two different sets of teachers, two different sets of acceptance for them. Back to you, Anne. This is great. I mean, actually, I was going to open it up. Radhika, Michelle, Tony, does any of this uh, resonate from some of the experiences you all are having? Absolutely. And um, go first, um, especially kind of the teachers and the technology adoption challenges. Uh, I hear about that quite a bit. And that is something we don't think enough about. I want to mention that in India, um, there is um, one part is just um, learning to use digital innovation. But another is just having that infrastructure. A lot of teachers in vulnerable regions don't have the digital access. And I want to share that Step in India is doing something interesting. They built a digital societal platform where they build infrastructure for everyone in the education ecosystem, teachers, uh, students, uh, other staff, um, to just be able to leverage uh, digital innovation for whatever they need, including training, but also content information. And they want to bring this to the rest of the world. And I think we need more of those kind of innovations as well as public-private partnerships. Uh, to make technology kind of like electricity. So it's seamless um, and easy to use uh, and doesn't need too much skilling, especially in education. Yeah, I would just add on to that, that I think sometimes it's also, at least what we've found with um, some of the, not only just teachers, but reading camp facilitators or um, you know parents who are leading uh, early childhood centers, um, we found that they just need to understand different strategies for using technology in their classroom. So, um, you know, is it uh, connecting one tablet to, um, to a projector and having a speaker so there's audio? Um, is it uh, having a bank of five tablets that they give um, kids rotating time on or, you know, a phone. Um, so just understanding different ways that um, the technology resources could be used and then also the classroom management and strategies alongside of them. Um, also important and we definitely have to do more to distribute kind of those experiences. 
You know, just in terms of expanding the human infrastructure, we have an initiative that's called Math Game Youth Ambassadors to train thousands of youth to basically serve as paraprofessionals to support teachers and parents in the community to help provide or support math instruction um, and math games specifically. And I, and I think about the a tremendous opportunity to engage caregivers, students, peer educators in this process to support learners with disability, either at the digital literacy end of the spectrum or the role modeling that basically they're sort of, sort of, So getting youth that have disabilities involved, as I mentioned, is one of my role models to help whatever the subject area of expertise is, I feel is a tremendous untapped opportunity that also connects to youth livelihood and, uh, and entrepreneurship. So I just wanna mention that as another human resource that's underutilized. Thank you. I think uh, some of the, you know, the, 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 I, you know, the idea of different strategies for using technology uh, to engage parents, teachers, and, and others. I think Sonali's question around removing biases of parents, teachers, and schools against the use of technology and motivate them to try tools, new tools, and uh, is I think getting towards that. Uh, Tony, you've mentioned uh, uh, math and STEM now a few times, and Ahomia mentioned that as well. We have a question that's come in around uh, 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 particularly chemistry. So Ann Miller. Uh, has asked that she's just recently learned of an effort to develop sign language uh, appropriate for chemistry as a as a laboratory science intended for educational and professional use. Are there similar efforts for the visually impaired that can allow students to participate in in lab aspects of science education? You know what? I'm actually I would defer to Benetech to be able to pull it back to my Benetech colleagues, um, just because this is obviously another area of expertise, but it's simply great to hear about other projects. One of the principal functions of the M Education Alliance is to avoid duplications of effort. And we're interested in sharing good practice experiences. If you don't subscribe, we have a bi-weekly e-news. Uh, and we'd love to do a e-news, if not more than one, focused on this topic. But I actually would invite others to respond to Anne's question. Since you mentioned Ben, like, I'll take a pass today. I mean, I, I I don't know if you're doing anything in particular to uh, uh, to lab use. Uh, we are though focusing heavily on STEM content. We know that is a source of major inequity for the visually impaired, right? Their STEM content is not accessible as much as text content because of the nature of it. You know, there's graphs and equations and, and diagrams, and we're investing a lot both technologically and, and in other resources to build tools that can actually enable us to uh, uh, convert uh, STEM content uh, to be accessible. And we've already made significant pro pro uh, progress on math content and um, um, within within Bookshare, uh, any most math equations have already been converted into a, a language uh, uh, that can be read by screen readers. But uh, more to come on this, and you're right, more, uh, more work, to, uh, particularly on some of the immersive uh, lab work. Uh, and I, I welcome hearing from others. There's a lot of comments and questions about uh, uh, um, opportunities and, and uh, partnerships. And I think, uh, uh, Radhika, there's a question from Ruchira for you specifically with respect to BRAX. I, can, I think you can probably take some of that offline. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes um, actually going back to each of you uh, to you know, talk about uh, what you think should be you know some of the takeaways from you from what you're seeing what you're hearing and what you'd like uh, this uh, global uh, uh, population that's joined us um, who uh, who also have have had i really enjoyed the linkedin chat i think you can you all are familiar with the great initiatives but also a lot of the challenges i'd love to you know for you to share any takeaway and i know that all of you are involved in so many different activities if there's anything you'd like to share about upcoming activities or uh, some of the work uh, of your organizations please do so now so um, i'll go in a slightly different order radhika why don't you start Um, sure. Um, so, so I myself am very involved in looking at how digital innovation can help uh, create innovations, um, whether it's for education or any of the SDGs. And uh, to me, these are very, very uh, important for achieving the dignity of every human being. 
And uh, if we can only level the digital playing field in the foundational area of education for the young trailblazers of the world, whether rural girls, refugees, differently abled, each and everyone is capable of not just succeeding economically and being self-reliant, but making the world a better place. And I wanted to say that um, the, the bias issue that came up, biases are very critical and they exist for a reason. Um, I am very involved in bias work on tackling biases and recognizing implicit biases. And uh, I would uh, love to connect with anyone interested in that. There is a project at Stanford looking at the nature of bias. And biases um, in technology and education, I think, also exist for a reason. Tech, I believe, is also doing tremendous harm, um, if not intentionally and carefully used, especially to the children of our world. So there's a question on the biases of parents. I do think we in the tech world from, um, from Silicon Valley, we have a long way to go to make technology safer for children. And that is something I'm involved in and um, would love to explore synergies with anyone interested. Thank you, Radhika. If, uh, my mouse decided to not uh, touch the mute button. Um, uh, Shelly, uh, uh, I'd like to turn to you next to share some thoughts as well. Well, I think I, I jumped the gun and I already shared the one thing. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, but I'll share another thing. Um, I think we at All Children Reading um, really want to just um, continue to support others in using accessible digital content and making sure that uh, kind of that last mile happens. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work together to um, work on getting born accessible book production and then getting those books produced in the most underserved languages. Um, and now there's the use piece on that and um, really ensuring that all of the great content that's available gets used by the intended children and their families. Um, is really important. So I know, Ian, we've been talking with you about how do all the books that are available for, for free and ready to go get on Bookshare, how do they get on other platforms? How are we cross-sharing accessible digital content so that everyone has access to them in their programs? And then how do we break down the barriers to using that content? Um, we're, we've heard a lot uh, from our ACR partners um, World Vision in particular is, is working really hard to understand, um, you know, some of those strategies I talked about earlier of using digital books in um, their reading camps and in some of the most remote areas. Um, I know there's initiative like initiatives like World Bank's Read at Home initiative that are really trying to get that last mile covered to make sure that, um, you know, children in the most remote context, in the most marginalized uh, situations are, are, are getting access to, to books and digital content. And uh, we just really wanna encourage use uh, as much as possible. Um, and we're excited about uh, all the work that, that is going on right now. We have some um, minimum and gold standards for sign language storybooks that are coming out um, that have been validated by a lot of our awardees. Um, and we're hoping that those can be useful to the world as well. Um, and yeah, lots, lots of um, opportunities. So thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Shelley. No, I think those are, those all are resonating with me. Uh, Tony, your your turn. Okay, just you had asked about some upcoming activities or related initiatives. Uh, just to, uh, maybe three of them. One of which is every year we do an annual symposium. Last two were virtual. This year will be uh, in person, and this will be our twelfth annual symposium. I'm going to drop a link to it. And when I and you may recall, and Shelley, for all the years that you've attended as well, when we first started, we didn't really have that many presentations that were focused on learners with disability, right? And then we had standing room uh, presentations about how many organizations were working in this space that we wanted to profile and highlight, not the least of which was Benetech, a consistent uh, member or joining the event. So one thing would be is we'd love to have this year's theme is wondrous learning is dot, dot, dot. 
And we'd love to have track sponsors and organizations that are helping define what wondrous learning is related to the subject that uh, Benetech's been featuring on these uh, webinars. And so we invite those that have suggestions or ideas for us to have a dedicated track on that. The second of which is I had mentioned uh, some other catalytic activities were interesting. I heard Shelly mention projectors. We're really interested in lowering the cost of educational video access um, by lowering the cost of like devices such as speaker projectors. And we have a campaign, it's a market shaping campaign. We're really excited about the use of low cost projectors to be able to support learners with disability. I think about some of the ACR projects that had supported closed captioning or that continue to support closed captioning. And one of the barriers is not having access to low cost video projection. So if those, there are organizations that are interested in um, video projection. Um, and then finally, we're just really interested in games, educational games, and would welcome those that have experience with games for uh, learners with disabilities, that we could highlight those. Can we lower the cost of those? Are there opportunities to disseminate those games or, or to take those games from develop, one developing context to another? So again, if you're focused, if you have interest in games, we think that this is a special area of interest that kids gravitate towards games. So I'll just, I'll stop there, Ian, and welcome any additional questions. Thanks, Tony. I think those are, those are, uh, uh, those are great for folks to follow up to, uh, with. Uh, I'm seeing some more questions come in, and I think, uh, Homer, since you're back, actually, as we turn to you uh, for some uh, some thoughts on, on takeaways, I also wanted to flag a question from Ritu about any, you know, any ideas around using similar strategies for adults, particularly for skill development. And I think this, you know, I think the work that we do in India is a good example of uh, potentially taking that further. So we'd love to get your thoughts on that as well as uh, any other takeaways you'd like to leave folks with. Thanks, Ian. So basically this whole initiative started uh, and I have been involved with it since years, primarily for supporting adults and uh, training adults into various job roles. And when we talk about digital literacy, as I said in the beginning, there are about 183 plus different job roles which are available that a visually impaired person can do, provided he has got the skill sets for that. And as I discussed earlier again, these skill sets are nothing else but simple basic reading and writing skill sets. So it's so very important that if one has to lead a life with dignity, if one has to be counted as a contributing partner in the society, not to be seen as somebody who's always dependent on, it's so very important that persons with visual impairment are seen differently. Currently, the notion that people see when they see a person with visual impairment on the road is more of sympathy, more of how does he do that? God has done so bad with him and all those sort of notions. We want to change that. We want to present to the world that, see, being blind is not bad. It's okay. If you can't see, it's fine. But if you have the right skill sets, if you have the right training, if you have the right opportunity, if you're given the right tools, you can contribute at par with any other person. And that is why in my introduction, I requested Anne to specifically state, probably I'm the only presenter on this panel, at least who's visually impaired. And looking at the list of uh, participants, I see very few people with visual impairment who are joined today. We want to have more participation of these visually impaired as equal opportunity partners. Back to you. Homer, very well said. I don't think there's much we can follow on to that. <laughs> uh, I will say that we're at, at Benetech, we are very proud to have you and many others, a significant portion, portion of our workforce, um, actually the users um, and visually impaired. And I'm, I'm excited and I hope that uh, collectively we are, we get to a point in which, uh, uh, you know, we've we are, I'll, I'll provide the opportunity for equal participation and and uh, and fulfillment. So I'm excited of what we're doing. All the initiatives that we've heard. Uh, there's some exciting stuff happening around the world.
world. Um, I have taken many notes here, and I think others have as well on folks to follow up with. Um, so I think I'll, I'll uh, uh, I think I'm going to have to wrap it up now. But uh, would uh, you know? Uh, uh, I want to say that you know we'll send information in our follow-up email to sign up uh, for the Benetech newsletter, so you will hear all about Homer's work and others' work, other work that we are doing and and helping. Um, also, uh, please follow our panelists. I think uh, most of them have shared their information here on the chat or on LinkedIn, uh, and you can keep up on their impactful work they're doing as well as their studies and and events. Um, I know I will be joining almost all a few of them that have been mentioned here uh the recording for this event will be sh shared later in the week uh we uh will have a, a survey following up so please do take that that helps us to evolve these and make it useful for you uh with that i would say thank you for joining us today and sharing your stories and questions i mean i you know there's so much that's been covered that we're not you know, there's, I think, no clear way for me to put a, a bow around the, the topics that we've discussed. But I think, you know, I think I've, I've, I've heard that we need to do more. I think that we're seeing our work evolve. I think there are some really interesting innovations coming and there are huge challenges, everything from, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender equity, from, you know, new types of uh, um, content like STEM content, um, you know, digital access. And I think there is need for more partnerships. So uh, hopefully, uh, this event can actually help instigate some of that and uh, you know everybody I you know wish you all the best and uh, uh, hope you consider some of the conversations and questions that have come up in uh, continuing our collective work towards equity in education so thank you everyone